Three days later and still that image of the Dolly cargo ship and the collapse of the Francis Scott Key Bridge here in Baltimore still so striking. I'm Joseph Omo coming up on the News 4 Rundown. We're going to get you up to speed on why officials are saying the road to recovery is going to be a long one and a daunting one. And then deal details. It turns out that the deal struck between D.C. and the owners of the Caps and Wizards goes far beyond area arena renovations. Our Mark Seagraves is breaking down the proposed agreement. Plus, growing up, I didn't see black dollars. I really got into this to take care of my community and to, to, to take care of patients. And I feel like I'm able to do that. How one local doctor achieved her dream after becoming a teen mom. You're watching the News 4 Rundown. Hi there, and thanks for joining us for the News 4 Rundown, our newscast streaming for you. I'm Leon Harris. Tommy McFly is going to be joining us here momentarily. It is Friday, March 29th, and we're going to begin now with a look at some of the top stories we're following today. Three young girls, a 12-year-old and two 13-year-olds have been arrested in connection with the killing of a 64-year-old man in the district. Police say Reggie Brown was beaten to death last October on Georgia Avenue Northwest. Law enforcement sources tell News 4 the arrest of the youngest girl came after she was shot and wounded at a home on Peabody Street in Northwest overnight. Three men are in custody in connection with Thursday's armed robbery in District Heights that ended with an officer shooting a suspect. Police say it started with the men stealing a car, and then soon after that, the suspects were accused of entering a GameStop store on Silver Hill Road in ski masks. All three men face armed robbery, assault, and firearms charges now. Hollywood is mourning the loss of trailblazing actor Louis Gossett Jr. Gossett became the first black man to win a Best Supporting Actor Oscar for his performance in An Officer and a Gentleman. He also took home an Emmy for his performance in the groundbreaking 1977 TV miniseries Roots. Louis Gossett Jr. was 87 years old. Former President Donald Trump's attorneys have filed a motion challenging a gag order connected to his hush money trial. The judge slapped Trump with that partial gag order earlier this week. It bars the, the president from, former president, I should say, from talking about witnesses and court staffers in the case. Trump is set to go on trial for this particular case on April 15th. Days later, we are getting a clearer picture of the difficult and dangerous recovery operation at the site of the collapsed bridge in Baltimore. Maryland Governor Wes Moore gave an update late this afternoon on the new cranes and the resources that are going to be used to help clean up the wreckage. News Force Joseph Olmo joins us now with a closer look at the damage and the cleanup efforts. Hey there, Governor Moore is describing the task ahead as daunting and all it takes is yet another look at that to understand why, right? You have part of the key bridge completely submerged. You have another part of the key bridge, literally millions of pounds of roadway and concrete and steel lying on the cargo ship itself. So you wonder, how do you even clean up the wreckage? Enter this, the Chesapeake 1000. That is a crane that can pick up something that weighs up to 2 million pounds. That is just one of the massive tools that'll be used in a challenging job ahead. Three days since the bridge collapse seen around the world and still a pile of questions about what happens next. To go out there and to see it up close, you realize just how daunting a task this is. You realize how difficult the work is ahead of us. Maryland Governor Wes Moore giving a glimpse into the challenging road ahead. First, he says, is the recovery, providing closure to the families who still have missing loved ones. Next is clearing the channel and reopening the port of Baltimore to vessels. Third, taking care of everybody affected by the collapse, including the 8,000 Baltimore port related jobs that are in limbo. And fourth, rebuilding the bridge. So I can't say right now if this is going to be, if this, how, what's the time period? I can tell you it is not going to be days or weeks or months. This is going to take time. Just reopening the port is a daunting task. Coast Guard officials describing it in three steps, clearing the debris from the channel, then removing the vessel, and finally moving all that sharp and mangled debris from the waterway. 
going in a place where the key bridge once proudly was erected and to be able to go under where it was and look up and see the blue sky and not see the bridge. Okay, so just to give you an idea of the size at play here, Governor Moore toured the wreckage with the Coast Guard earlier today. He says that the cargo ship you're looking at right now is about the size of the Eiffel Tower. He said it was incredible to see these shipping containers that we see on the roads all the time or on trains sliced in half like they were paper mache. I'm Joseph Omo, News 4. Joseph, thank you for that paper mache. Think about that. Mm -hmm. Victims of the heart of the bridge collapse are what everyone's been thinking about. Mm -hmm. And those victims are honored today. The Central American Solidarity Association of Maryland, or CASA, held a press conference uh, on, to bring together immigrant workers in the wake of the deadly collapse. Here, we are reminded once again about the enormous contribution that the immigrants made to this country. How together, we U.S. board workers, we build this country. Activists say that this collapse is a reminder of the protections that many essential workers need while doing dangerous jobs. As the investigation continues and progress is made to reopen the channel, News 4 is working for you on every platform, 24-7. You can get updates on air, online, and in the NBC Washington app. In other developments this week, first on four, new details coming out now about that tentative deal that was struck between the district and Monumental Sports that's going to keep the Caps and the Wizards in D.C. So as News 4's Mark Seagraves is reporting this out, it includes allowing for more outdoor advertising around the arena, extra police protection, and it would exempt Monumental from any new taxes that might benefit Washington commanders coming to D.C. The deal signed between Mayor Bowser and Ted Leonsis this week is filled with provisions beneficial to Monumental beyond the $515 million for improvements to the arena. Among the more notable pieces of the deal, which is non-binding and subject to change, Monumental would be exempt from any new taxes that would benefit another sports franchise. It would allow the Mystics to play four regular season games plus any playoff games at Capital One Arena. Monumental would be allowed to expand outdoor digital signage around their arena. It would give Monumental full control of the entertainment and sports arena in Southeast and require the district to perform monthly power washing of the sidewalks around Cap One Arena. While the tax exemption benefiting any new sports franchise seems aimed at a possible new tax to help pay for a new commander's move to D.C., Today, Mayor Bowser said keeping the Caps and Wizards in D.C. sends a clear message to Commander's team owner Josh Harris that the city is ready to deal. It demonstrates that we're serious about sports, um, that our community is serious about sports, that we recognize the spinoff value of um, making sports and infrastructure investments mean. Uh, we, saw, we see it with Nats Park um, in the Capitol Riverfront that has developed around Nats Park and now Audi Field. Uh, we see it, uh, we saw it in a negative way, even with just the mere announcement um, that our sports teams would leave the downtown, uh, that we think it, it led to some pessimism uh, that infected the whole economy. Um, so we know uh, the value of having um, great franchises and great projects, and we're committed to both. The tentative deal would allow Monumental to keep all revenue from outdoor advertising around the revenue. It would also require enhanced police protection around the arena on days when there are any events. Leonsis has complained that the smaller entertainment and sports arena in Congress Heights is too small for the Mystics. The deal would also give Monumental the option of building a new training facility for the Wizards at either Gallery Place or RFK Stadium. In the district, Mark Seagraves, News 4. A Monumental spokesperson released a statement to News 4 saying that they look forward to the D.C. Council vote coming on Tuesday to pass Mayor Bowser's Downtown Arena Modernization and Downtown Revitalization Act of 2023. That statement continued, uh, quote, We will then have the opportunity to get to work on the development agreement 
and articulate the fine points of the deal, end quote. Mm -hmm. And it is decision day in the district. No, not for colleges, not that decision day. Today, D.C. Mayor Mario Bowser joined students at Ida B. Wells Middle School to celebrate high school decision day when eighth graders are matched up with the high school of their choice in the My School D.C. lottery. More than 23,000 students across the district receive their school matches for next school year. We see strong academic performance. We see that you recognize that every day is important to choose to be here on time and be present and be engaged. And so we're excited that you're creating uh, a path of excellence. At the celebration, the mayor and education leaders also announced the awardees of more than a million dollars in grants. That's some good stuff right there. How cool is that? Mm -hmm. And Saturday is National Doctors Day. It's a moment for us to take a minute and honor the physicians and their skills and their commitment to providing health care for all of us. Tonight, we're introducing you to a Howard University graduate. She's really special. Mm. She achieved her dream of becoming a doctor after she became a mother at the age of 15. News Force Dominique Moody has her story. Growing up, I didn't see black daughters. I really got into this to take care of my community and to, to, to take care of patients. And I feel like I'm able to do that. Hi, Ms. Abner. How are you? Dr. Katherine Kelly. I am blessed. I can't complain. Has traveled a long way to get to this point in her medical career. Do you have any history of, of autoimmune stuff? Like no. autoimmune disease? Her dream of becoming a doctor never wavered after she discovered motherhood would begin at the age of 15. Even in being a, a, a teen parent, like people in school know, everybody knew, um, but I also was still the person that was doing what I needed to do and also being encouraging to others. The motivation for providing for her daughter made her laser focused on her dreams. When I was still trying to go to school and still trying to get good grades and that kind of thing. Dr. Kelly credits her mother for encouraging her to reach her goals and go to Howard University. She did just that and chose to double major in anthropology and biology. In real life, it's not glamorous, right? Like you're not, at least for me, all while juggling motherhood, Kelly's determination paid off in 2001 when she graduated from Howard University with not one, but two degrees. I don't know if you ever see me with my white coat on. <laughs> she was later accepted and graduated from Howard's College of Medicine. Having gone through what I went through allows me to be humble when I'm talking to my patients and allows me to be a better doctor, a better wife, a better human being. You know the story too, that I had my daughter when I was 15 yes. in high school. She knows. It's patients like Bernice Bass Abner, who says she appreciates Dr. Kelly's story and her attention to patients' needs. She feels like a friend taking care of a friend. I always feel like she's got my very best interest at heart. All right, come on this way. Common courtesy and kindness, two major components of Dr. Kelly's private practice entitled the Kelly Collaborative Medicine. Healing is more than just the medicine you give. Healing is about how you make people feel in your space. <laughs> Wait, did you go? In Silver Spring, <laughs> Dominique Moody, News 4. Thanks, Dominique. What a great journey she's been on already. What a great example she has set. Mm -hmm. Still to come here on the News 4 Rundown, we continue to celebrate her story with Women's History Month. Sean Yancey introduces us to the first black woman to own her own champagne brand. Why she decided to take the leap there. Plus, I'm in Yang with Chef Isabel Koss. And this is a? A buñuelo. A buñuelo. I thought you needed some dessert. I do need dessert. <laughs> we'll have much more with this award-winning chef coming up. Welcome back to the News 4 Rundown. I hope you are hungry and you have not had your Friday dinner yet because it is food fair time. That's right. Our Un Yang joins us now with a taste of Mexico City at Pascual. You may know Chef Isabel Cas from her delectable desserts at Lutes, which is in Georgetown, but she recently opened up this spot on Capitol Hill. It's called Pascual, and she says it's a love letter to her hometown of Mexico City. Now, you might not find your typical Mexican fare here, but she says when you go inside, she wants you to feel at home. There's nothing better than a chip and a guacamole. A homemade tortilla makes all the difference, right? A homemade tortilla makes all the difference. Makes all the it's difference. Been, so yes. Tell me how you make yours. Okay, so for tortillas at Lutez, we import the corn. It's like heirloom corn organic. The corn usually comes with everything. Like it's gonna sell you, tell you like amarillo, 
where, the, where did it grow? Like this one's come from Oaxaca. So there's four varieties. There's like blue, white, uh, pink, and yellow. So this is a molino. It is, um, it, the, the heart of it is two volcanic rocks. This is unique for corn. So if you want to make corn, uh, you have to do this. Even when you buy like tortillas from the store, they do this. There you go. Tell me why you wanted to bring Pascual to this area. Um, I wanted to open a Mexican restaurant. Uh, it's the cuisine I grew up with. I'm from originally from Mexico City, uh, born and raised. Uh, it's the cuisine I grew up eating, it's the one I know, it's the one my family taught me, it's the one I miss, it's the one I know how to communicate, mm -hmm. my creativity, my environment, the things that are happening right now. So it was it was gonna happen eventually. I'm so happy it's here in Capitol Hill and in DC. This was cooked on lime on a lime solution yesterday, and today we just wash it, we take that away. And this is your dream from the beginning? Yes, so when me and my husband moved to Washington DC, uh, we met the Popales, uh, the Popal group. They're incredible. Uh, from the beginning, it was open a Mexican restaurant. That was always a dream. And then they needed help at Lutez. So we've been at Lutez for the last three years, trying to brew this up, but also doing our best over there. Like uh, Lutez made us fell in love with DC, so it made very easy the transition. After that, we just like mix it with a little bit of water, we season it with salt, and we make tortillas. And there's, so there's not a lot that goes into it, just has to be really good corn. Just has to be really good corn. Um, and goes to the right process. And right, go to the right <laughs> process. The right process is very important. It's, yes. uh, it's, it's a very old technique, you know, that, that we're happy to do, and you have to do it to get fresh corn. To make the tortillas, um, it's a very simple process, uh, but you need to like not dry them and cook them all the way. So oh. we flip them like two times. You don't want to cook them all the way. You don't want to cook them all the way. Like you, you cook them all the way, but slowly. Slowly. Because you don't want them to dry out. Ooh. I Just think co fresh corn is, fresh corn smells, mm. fresh corn, you know, tells a story. Oh, it's delicious. delicious. You can almost smell it through mm -hmm. the screen, can't yeah. you? Yeah. More with Un and Chef Isabel now streaming on Roku and Amazon Fire TV. Just download the free NBC Washington app and scroll to the Herstory playlist. All right, when we come back from kite flying to Bloomaroo, there's plenty going on this weekend around town. I'm breaking it all down, including the theater boom we've got going on. It's coming up in the weekend scene. Something for everyone. Normally, when you're told to go fly a kite, it's not great. But Saturday, the National Cherry Blossom Festival Kite Festival will soar high on the National Mall. It kicks off at 10 a.m. You'll see incredible kites built by masters, performances in the air and on the ground, plus a chance to fly your own. It's fantastic. It's, it's color in the sky, color in the air. There's free workshop kites that you could build. Your kids could come, you can come. Family can come build a kite for free. The theater scene is also in bloom, budding brand new shows like Nancy at Mosaic Theater. It looks at Nancy Reagan's family connection to Pocahontas. And it's a fun comedy that does this crazy, absurdist madcap of a journey where you get to see Nancy Reagan, but also the story of Esmeralda, this Navajo woman who's fighting actually um, for the uh, clearing of uranium mines on her reservation. And the play is kind of like a crash course where these two women finally collide towards the end of the play. A world premiere of Hester Street, an adaptation of the 1970s film by the same name, premieres at Theater J. Schoolgirls, which has been called the African Mean Girls, takes the stage at Next Stop in Herndon. Unknown Soldier, an original musical, brings a three-generation family mystery to arena stage. And only theaters of Oz is timed perfectly for Persian New Year Nehru's telling the creator's mom's story of fleeing Tehran for, as he says, Tarangelus in California. The rescheduled Bloomeroo at the Wharf is on Saturday. Music, family fun, it's a big spring celebration and fireworks. And don't forget, Monday is Nats opening day in D.C. against Pittsburgh. 405 start. Have an awesome weekend. Hope they do better than their uh, on the road start. Their home start will be better. Yeah, let's Fingers hope the cross. rain holds off. Yes, and speaking of, one of the oldest events in the district is underway on Monday, too. The White House Easter egg roll. Mm -hmm. I'll be back again this year emceeing. Uh huh. 40,000 people will be joining you there. I'm going to high five every one of them. <laughs> <laughs> All of you guys gathered on the South Lawn at the White House. This year's wooden eggs feature the first pets, Commander, and Willow. 
and they don't bite this here uh, in this version <coughs> of them. Uh, they also true. have signatures from the president and the first lady on the eggs. This tradition dates back to 1878 when President Rutherford B. Hayes invited the egg rollers to come to the White House. Yes, yeah, so a fun fact. It used to happen sort of as a local thing on the Capitol lawn, but Congress actually passed a law to not have the lawn be a playground because it affected the grass. Mm -hmm. And so then the local students literally said, hey, President Hayes, when he was walking, can we come to the White House? And he was like, sure. So, you know, you never know. Yep, Democracy in action. You ask the president <laughs> if you can go over and sometimes you can. So this March and every March is Women's History Month and NBC4 is highlighting women who are innovators and game changers. That's right. And our Sean Yancey introduces us now to a trailblazer on a mission to share her bubbles with the world. Yeah, guys, today I'm introducing you to a woman who graduated with a biology degree to follow her dream of becoming a doctor, but was intrigued with finance, spent two decades on Wall Street only to give it all up and follow her true love, champagne. Marvina Robinson is the first black American woman to own a champagne brand. So you always want to keep your thumb over the cork. She may be one of the first, but she doesn't like being described as a trailblazer. I look at myself as an entrepreneur striving to meet her goals. What does it feel like? A roller coaster. There are days where I'm riding high, there are days where I'm riding low. Marvina's had more highs than lows. Her love of champagne began in her early 20s. She and her childhood friends would come home on college breaks and sit on the stoops in front of their homes in Brooklyn, New York's Bedford Stuyvesant neighborhood. So we would chip in, buy a bottle of champagne, um, and naturally we were broke. So. We would ship it out money and we would drink out of plastic cups. Over the years, Marvina traded in her plastic cup for glass and crystal as her love of champagne grew along with her palate and curiosity. In 2014, while working on Wall Street, she started traveling to champagne country on the weekends as a hobby. I would get her to France uh, Saturday morning in Paris, so I stayed at the same hotel. And then from there, shower change, get the train to get me to the Champagne region. And then I would just start exploring. Eventually, her weekend champagne hobby turned into a business idea. I realized like how much my knowledge for champagne or my love for it was getting heightened. And I realized, okay, I'm going to find a way to do this. Marvina's original plan was to serve quality, lesser known champagnes along with her own house brand. But then the pandemic hit. So instead of opening her champagne bar, Marvina pivoted and decided to launch her own champagne brand. When I first launched in 2020, we only had two cuvées. Today, we have a total of eight cuvées in the portfolio. Marvina Robinson Champagne is grown, harvested, bottled, and imported from Champagne, France. Its name, B. Stuyvesant, is personal. I wanted the brand to really represent me more about me, didn't want to label it Robinson or whatever, that just didn't flow. But I also wanted to pay homage to my neighborhood, right? Where I was born and raised, I still reside in Beverly Stuyvesant. So many memories, and I realized, like, I wanted to name it Stuyvesant Champagne. Marvina is no stranger to owning and running a business. The former indoor cycling studio and cafe owner is excited to be expanding her wings in a $7 billion industry dominated by European men. No, I'm not a norm in this, in this industry, right? We all know that black people, women of color, we're less than 1% of this conglomerate industry. This still kickback or, you know, nuances, but I take that as uh, it's not gonna slow me down. Like I have my goals. I move with a purpose with Peace Stuyvesant. We are growing, we have great supporters. This is actually the Grand Reserve Group. So From the young girl who thought she wanted to be a doctor, who ended up becoming a Wall Street VP, who's now living her dream as the first black American woman to own a champagne brand. And I feel like my journey from when I launched to where I'm at now, I haven't reached the pinnacle yet, but I feel like I'm getting it little bit by little bit. So I take my praises and I just move it long by long. Cheers. Cheers, Cheers yes. to you. Thank Cheers you. to you. Thank you. And little by little, she's expanding. Beast Iverson is now available in D.C. at the Thompson Hotel in Navy Yard and also Urban Grape in Northwest D.C. Also, wine enthusiasts just released ratings gave her a 90, which is considered excellent and especially huge for a smaller, lesser known brand. So cheers to her and guys, cheers to you. All right. Cheers to you. Thank you, Sean.
All right, finally tonight, calling on all Queen Bay fans. Time to giddy up to the Cowboy Carter Rodeo. Yeah, Beyonce's Act 2 Cowboy Carter album dropped at midnight. The Beehive has had all night to listen to 27 tracks, adding up to 90 minutes, 90 minutes. of music. It's the Superstar's eighth studio album and features country legends like Dolly Parton, Willie Nelson, Miley Cyrus is on it. From a tribute to country pioneers as well to Linda, Man Linda Martell is on there. It's got so much. The album is a deep exploration of the past, present, and future of country music. And earlier this week, I spoke to musician Shug Daniels about how the album highlights black artists who have already been working in the genre. It shines a light. It takes the light from uh, uh, where maybe people historically think in the media what black people should be quote unquote doing what we're most popular for doing which is creating uh, new genres and, and being very innovative and saying don't forget about these people that are continuing to champion something that we've been doing a very very long time you've probably seen her post on instagram beyonce said that the album came from her experience of not feeling welcome well, she's welcome now mm -hmm. at the top of the chart she added that experience inspired her to study country music's history and the blend of genres together to create this album. A lot of good stuff on there. The version of Jolene that she I did. I listened to that one online before coming in. That's your homework. Do listen to that and let us know what you think on Monday. Perfect I'm Tommy McFly. All right, that's going to do it for the News for a Rundown. Thanks for joining us. I'm Leon Harris.